Good evening, spiritual warriors. Welcome to our class on spiritual warriorship, where we read, discuss books by His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami. And we are now on Spiritual Warrior 5. Now remember, I've said it many times, he has many books, 16 altogether, or 17 now. And you can purchase at Krishna.com store online, or also at Harinam Press, who are the publishers of these books, by going to um, harinampress.org. And there you can... Um, read excerpts from each of the books but I'm hoping that some of you have gotten who are watching listening and are reading because he gives wonderful insight to help us in our spiritual growth and now we're hearing from him <clears throat> from spiritual warrior 5 chapter 6 entitled the great no <laughs> The Perfect Escape. I think there was, somebody was telling me there was a movie named The Great Escape. I don't remember it. But this is about perfect escape. And he shows us step by step almost how to work towards that because we're all prisoners. We're prisoners in this material body. Just as a pair of prisoners behind high walls and gates and all kinds of guards around watching that he won't escape. He reminds us that this material body we're in and the material world that this material body is in is a place of misery. In fact, Krishna tells us that in Bhagavad Gita. But just as even in the prison world with people behind bars, some of them plan escapes. And... Um, somewhat a perfect escape, of course. And they strategize and try to work out how they can do that. Well, those of us in the spiritual uh, consciousness are understanding this miserable world we're in and this body we're in, as the expression goes, we're making the best of a bad bargain, so to speak. But we need to plan. A perfect escape. Because I remember hearing the Prabhupada said you can end the cycle of birth and death this lifetime. And we've been around so many, 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 many lifetimes. And thankfully we're in a material body at this time where we can use our intelligence and consciousness to inquire and to find the teachers be led to. You, don't, you go out and find, you might not know what you find, but if you allow the Lord in the heart to guide you to a spiritual teacher and mentor who opens your eyes with the torchlight of knowledge, and then you begin to plan your escape, and you see that escape is possible. That's the wonderful thing about it. So I'm not going to review anything. You know I like to review, but I want us to move ahead. And the only question I'll put out is that those of you who have been hearing from this chapter, that has there been any word, any concept presented, any thought that has helped you through this past week or the past couple of weeks or in your spiritual life or deepened your understanding of the importance of the perfect escape, or, in other words, how to get the heck out of here. Okay, so let's see where we are tonight, and remember, it's all for spiritual growth. And coming with much love from Bhakti Tirtha Swami, and I'm just making this as an offering to him to share with you that may increase your spiritual understanding. So we're up to the section that's entitled, Our Consciousness Creates Our Escape. Now, he tells us that when a prisoner plans his or her escape, the excitement about freedom 
escalates as the time passes. Now, he or she makes so many plans, you know that, in order to avoid detection. However, the prisoner is also anxious. Will he or she succeed? Now, if they are too anxious, what happens? Give themselves away, right? They become anxious and fearful about the negative. The fear itself could expose them. Now, this anxiety could cause them to lose their dexterity when a difficult situation arises. So he gives these examples, analogies, that try to make a picture for us to understand what we're going through on the spiritual level. When we're in too much pain, anxiety, gloom, or frustration, we can't possibly escape because we will fail to chant our rounds with sufficient intensity, cook for the Lord with full love and devotion. We can't possibly dress the deities with sufficient love or associate with other spiritualists with the necessary care and compassion. What brings, what makes us go into that state? If we're too much in pain, we're anxious or gloomy or frustrated. It blocks, those blocks, obstacles, if you will. Trying to get settled here, I'm just it seems like once I'm facing you, I gotta get in more position. Okay. With excessive negative anxiety, we will lose our potency as spiritualists. And now I hope you remember we looked at the difference between anxiety and um, excitement. By focusing that energy in a negative direction, we will distract ourselves. However, we cannot just stop the energy because inactivity will not lead us to success. Right? We've talked about this anxiety. It's a negative energy and it can drain you and even make you sick, physically sick. However, we can't just sit still, twiddle our thumbs. Remember, even Arjun, he didn't want to go on the battlefield and fight. He just wanted to, you know, go out begging. Krishna told him, no way. You've got a duty to do and you're going to do it. But remember, he did eventually go to fight, but it was because he wasn't fighting for himself or trying to please himself. He was endeavoring to please Krishna. So we want to put our energy into excitement. Now that will bring about short-term victories and long-term victories. Remember we talked about setting goals, but setting short-term goals. Negative anxiety does what? It creates fear and stagnation, which will defeat a person before he or she even begins. In some cases, the defeatist mentality and lack of self-esteem will cripple a person to the point that he or she cannot function at all. Or 
it will create the exact situation that he or she wanted to avoid in the first place. Therefore, we must constantly absorb ourselves in transcendental literature and pastimes of the Lord and Acharyas so that it will give us excitement and help us plan and execute the perfect escape. What just came to me, and I don't know if I was out there listening or in a room listening to the readings of Bhakti Tirta Swami, but he gives so many instructions in such a simple way to help us in our spiritual growth. Where is it here? He says, we must constantly absorb ourselves in transcendental literature and pastimes of the Lord and the Acharyas so that it will give us excitement and help us plan and execute the perfect escape. So if our focus is truly, seriously wanting this, these kinds of instructions to make a note of and want to work on or follow through on, that's just me and that's what I think I would do. But I'm just happy to be able to offer these instructions. Now he says, just knowing that freedom is attainable will increase our zeal tremendously. And we've been hearing enough, I think, if we've been reading and hearing and chanting and remembering and even hearing from Bhakti Tirtha Swami that escape is possible. That's really our goal to go back home, back to God. And there's so many things that can interfere and we're, he's bringing out these stories and analogies to show us, remind us, alert us as to what could be an obstacle or try to prevent that progressiveness if we are seriously, honestly interested and have said that, know that that's the goal of our being here. Some people have already escaped and we want to join them. It will increase our enthusiasm even more when we hear about their activities. We will want to join them Excuse me, seeming so restless. I'm just trying to um, get in a good position. My doctor says I should put my feet up, and I've got them up, but they want to be down. <laughs> so I'm trying to get comfortable here. A little bit of everything. Let you on the inside of what's going on inside the family. But listen, we really were talking about escaping. And believe me, I'm serious about paying attention here. Escaping this old material body. I want to try and get it right this time. This lifetime. Because I don't know how many times I've been around. But I'd like to get it right this time and have a perfect escape when the time comes. So we want to join them, those who have already escaped, to participate in what? In eternal joyous pastimes. Now, on the other hand, a person will inherently fail if he or she accepts the prison as a permanent residence and just continue to act according to the limitations. But that's what knowledge is about. That's why we're getting the knowledge. That is why we read the Sastras. 
That is why we read Srila Prabhupada's books and try to get others to read it so that we won't stagnate and do this trip again and again. The whole idea of freedom will seem like a romantic fairy tale. Since their experience is limited to the environment, they will not be able to even imagine another reality. Uh, these are he's describing persons who have accepted this temporary body and, and stay here as permanent. Huh? They become stagnant and, and, and really the experience is limited to the environment only. Now while residing in these material bodies, in these hellish material realms, we must continue to plan for escape. We do not want to keep doing the same thing that has kept us in incarceration for many years lifetimes. And even I realized that understanding this statement, we don't want to keep doing the same things that have kept us in incarceration for many lifetimes. And that's even a realization. And I say that because some time ago when I was living at Gita Nagri, someone gave a class and um, I don't remember what the subject was, the verse, whatever. But I remembered asking a question. And they referred me to Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 12. Which I think I had or I borrowed. I don't know. And it's interesting. But I'm just giving you what I remember that gave me a new realization that when I'm reading here, it, it means something to me, I'm just sharing with you. And I went to Canto 12, can't remember the chapter or the verse, but there is reading about Brahma and his lifetimes and, you know, all how the years, one day is this. I, but what happened with that particular reading, it was like a light went off and, oh my gosh, that's, me, I've been around that many lifetimes. And then was like a realization. Also, this lifetime, I am now being made conscious and aware of having been around that many lifetimes. You understand what I'm saying? And that, as he talks here about excitement, and I became more determined, for want of a better word right now, to study this philosophy and to try and understand it because I had heard, as I mentioned before, Srila Prabhupada's statement that you can end the cycle of birth and death this lifetime. I had heard life going around the cycle of birth and death but it was like theoretical. But that particular day, it was like real. It's me I'm talking about lifetime after lifetime. Who knows how many millions, zillions, if there's such a thing. But I have an opportunity now. And that's why reading this, for me, endeavoring to share with you, it's, it's, it's real. It's not just some fancy or a few words he's putting out there, da 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 da. It's real. And this whole concept of escaping is real. And he keeps, and he tells us, and I don't, however, life, you're in a miserable place. Even if you're 
la di da happy right now. You'll have happiness and you'll have distress. But Krishna tells us, and we read that earlier, that this material world is a place of misery. So we don't want to keep doing the same things that have kept us in this prison. And that's what we're doing now. We want to see how to begin a process or continue our process or strengthen our process to have the perfect escape or in other words, get the heck out of here. So we might compare our position or confinement and our endeavor for escape so that, oh, he wants to compare it. He's making this comparison now. He does a lot of that. He want, we might want to compare our position and confinement and our endeavor for escape to that of a battered woman or a slave in captivity. In the material world, volunteers have established centers to help battered women escape from their suffering. They often have to strategically plan with the help of other survivors along the way and to find support systems so that they can discreetly leave. The women need a temporary place to stay and in some cases she might even need to leave the city, change her name for her personal protection. Also during the time of slavery in America we saw the establishment of the Underground Railroad and safe houses to help free those in slavery. Those involved in the rescue efforts would make serious plans and often travel with the slaves to get them out of certain environments and states. Now it tells us that the acharyas or teachers have the ability and proper knowledge to assist us, but they cannot help us if we remain stubbornly attached to our situation. Hmm? If the battered woman is too fearful to make a change, even though she has a chance and an alternative, she will remain imprisoned by her circumstances. However, if she has the proper excitement to make a change and escape, from the torture of battery, that vision and excitement will help her attain the perfect escape. So he's comparing that to us and where we want. Are you satisfied in your miserable condition? And it may not appear miserable, although you'll have those moments when you recognize it. Both parties, the guides and the prisoners, have a responsibility to make this escape possible because the guides might be ready to assist, but the victim must be simultaneously ready to accept the help. Some people remain in an abusive relationship until they die. Sometimes it even ends more tragically if the husband kills the woman. Now unfortunately, 
the woman sometimes has too much fear of the alternative. Hmm? She might feel a little security in the relationship because of having a house and money and fears the alternative. Where will I go? Who will take care of me? How will I manage? And again, what I'm feeling is here's where if we have some spiritual life or on a spiritual path, we begin to develop faith because these situations can occur in our lives. But if it's time for change or we're getting help to change, if we have faith in something we feel stronger than us, we can begin moving without so much fear. Now she might also fear that the man may come after her. But of course, these are real issues and that sometimes may hinder the escape. Now, also for spiritualists, they have <laughs> a personality he says, Maya or illusions make similar attacks when we try to run from her grasp. We feel it impossible to get rid of our bad habits. Maybe we don't want to even try because we do not think that we will be able to stop permanently. Once we stop, they will just attack and involve us again. So we don't even want to make the initial endeavor. With this mentality, there is obviously no question of escape. Some people have already accepted that their state of imprisonment will continue. It is, it's complex, it's complex. The person doesn't escape because of intense anxiety, but the person does escape because of intense excitement. <laughs> In both cases, a person is putting intense energy into their meditation. And one who perfectly escapes anticipates victory and then visualizes the ultimate outcome. So it's where you put your attention, what you meditate on, that will manifest in your life. And he's telling you, rather than meditate on the anxiety and the fear, you meditate on the excitement and forward movement. Even when we engage in the activities meant for our escape, if we have too much anxiety during our services and spiritual activities, we will not benefit. At times, we might try to chant pray, or meditate with so much negative anxiety that it is as if we didn't do it at all. Our minds are not present even though our bodies are engaged. If we hear a class and our minds are in so much anxiety, the message will not really penetrate into our consciousness. 
And that's where it has to go into our consciousness. This whole concept of escaping and the instructions we're getting to go with it into consciousness. And then you meditate, you begin the processes of change. If we dress the deities, but feel so much anxiety, fear, lust, enviousness, and anger, the rejuvenating act of associating so closely with the Lord will not quite help us. The person who has spent too long in confinement will develop all kinds of dysfunctional patterns because confinement is unnatural. If we continue for too long without spiritual excitement, then we will once again start to develop all kinds of unhealthy patterns. As our anxiety increases, we will take shelter of that which will what? Only make our problem worse. That anxiety increases. Unfortunately, we see it happening to us and around us as part of the unhealthy spiritual journey. So we're going to go on to on the verge of escape. Anybody in the chat room? Yeah? Carol, David, Edgar, and Bhuvan Mohan. Ah, Carol, welcome, David, Edgar. Nice to know you're there. Are there any questions or comments up to this point? Maybe we'll finish this chapter tonight. I'm not quite sure. Okay. He takes us to the fifth canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam that describes Bart. Maharaj, an exalted king of Bharata Varsha, who had incredible opulences and facility to enjoy. I hope, do you all know that story of um, Bharat Maharaj? He had so much fame that the entire planet was called Bharat Varsa in his honor. But in spite of the opulences, he walked away from it all, understanding that from the highest material position to the lowest, all are places of misery. He renounced his entire kingdom in order to focus on a higher goal. He understood that even as a sophisticated prisoner, all his opulence, power, and wealth could not offer him any permanent satisfaction and would just increase the incarceration. His actions help us understand that we also should not, should not put all our energy into something that will only increase our prison sentence. Now, we remember the story he, he left home. And he went to Pulahasrama to perform austerities and worship the Lord. Now due to his level, deep level of devotion, he began to exhibit 
symptoms of ecstasy, having attained the stage of Bob. So he had made it almost to the door, the perfect escape. He had let go, renounced, and was just meditating. And then what happened? Remember the story here in where he was located? One day a deer, mother deer, pregnant deer, was drinking water there and a lion or some huge animal came, made a loud sound, frightened her, and she dropped the baby and picked up the baby. But there's something here that I found interesting. I don't think I want to skip over as he's describing Mahabharat, Bharat Maharaj. And he reminds us that many, the author reminds us that many times intensely, people intensely involve themselves in this process of bhakti, but then become bewildered by offenses, lack of faith, and so on get pretty close. Now, unfortunately, they come so close only to get recaptured. What happens when a prisoner escapes and um, escapes from prison and then later he's recaptured, found? They lock him up tight when they bring him back. And they pay special attention to him for any behavior that may look like he's trying that same thing again. And Bhakti to Swami is saying, unfortunately, the same thing can happen when a devotee accelerates in spiritual life, but then gets recaptured by Maya she will make it so much harder for the devotee to continue. Maya finds so many ways to debilitate and dismantle the person's devotion, faith, and support system. But that's her job. That's what she was hired for. And she does it well. And what is the purpose of it? So that we don't escape with our nonsense. Because we can't get back to God. We can't go back to the spiritual world carrying a lot of baggage. It's about surrendering. And when we think we may be ready and think la di da, I've done it all, of all the rituals, all the prayers, all everything, and there's still some anathas in us, little dust on the mirror of the heart. Her job is to stop us where we are. And if we learn sometime from that stopping obstacle, it's for us to become more purified. But sometimes we just fall back into old patterns. But Maya finds so many ways to debilitate and dismantle a person's devotion, faith, and support system. Now, the individual is taking shelter of his or her imprisonment. From these factors, we can understand the madness and the danger. So it's the same thing with a battered woman. When she finally gets away, she can make a total shift in her life, no longer fearing the moment when her husband will attack with violence. So, and similarly, the slave... Um, no longer has to worry about being misused, abused, and even killed. However, it takes great 
intensity to reach that goal. And failure to complete the escape once the mission has begun is even more dangerous. Now for the woman who does escape, she now feels so much compassion for those still in a state of suffering. The slave also felt sadness for those who they left behind. Now similarly, those personalities who have escaped from this realm or those eternally liberated souls feel intense compassion when they think of the souls still bound by the body. They feel even sadder to watch a person who has almost escaped fall once again into the shackles of Maya. So the person often becomes so much more demoralized after falling back into the trap. They may even lose their hope for future attempts. So he went back to Bart Maharaj, who he tells of how he saw the baby deer and he took it up and he took care of it. He fed it and he reminded us that he was really a very pious surrendered soul. But what happened? He began thinking constantly of the deer, giving all his attention to the deer. Maya can destruct us in so many ways because we engage in devotional service but serve with pride and greed. And see, this was a pious act. You'd say that was very kind of him. But Maya can also get you if you're doing a lot of pious things because there's still some, what we say, gray areas there. So Mar Maharaj, Bharat Maharaj, had practically escaped from the material prison. But Maya found the exact way to draw him away. At his level of devotion, he could not have been allured by intoxication, illicit sex, or any other gross sinful activity. But he got distracted by a pious act. Hmm. Hmm. So even there we have to be careful if we, if we are pretty well on our spiritual path and uh, endeavor sometimes in a pious act. He says, the author says, it does not mean that we shouldn't be pious, righteous, or ethical. But it means that when we have a mission to escape, we must focus on reaching the conclusion without allowing any distractions to hinder our progressive march. And that can be difficult, you know. Oh, but I'm helping. I have to go and help. I have to do. It may not be, depending on where you are. And the Lord in the heart will really let us know sometimes that we may just keep on. And my understanding now is that the Lord is in everybody's heart. The Lord is everywhere present. And he will take care of that situation if it seems I have to continue uh, in, a, in a spiritual direction. This is really something to hear. Some people 
might get distracted from the devotional path when a seemingly good situation happens, such as wealth or opulence. If someone on the path to escape is very sickly and their health is suddenly renewed, they may lose their intensity and ability to focus. Or an unmarried devotee might even have been very focused on the escape mission, but after they find a partner, they become distracted. Due to the relationship, they focus so much more on maintenance. Many allurements and distractions can disturb us if we are not careful. They do not have to, but they can. Now in this case, a small, helpless animal affected the heart of a compassionate sadhu. Look how Maya came in disguise in such a discreet way. The deer distracted him to the point that he focused less on his original escape plan as he focused more energy on caring for the deer he focused less on his sadhana and devotion and I'm sure if we think of situations all through our life short life we've been in here and because we can't remember past lives at least I can't but we'll see how we may be pretty fixed on the past. So I met hearing, chanting, remembering, and suddenly something distracts us. It's quite challenging. The deer distracted him to the point that he focused less on his original escape plan. And that's what we have to be able to do this whole section we read on introspection keep the goal in mind keep the path straight in front of it and be mindful and alert of any distraction that comes along now since he put so much energy into taking care of the deer Thinking about the deer, spending time with the deer, and embracing the deer, he gradually began to forget his original scheme. Just as a prisoner gets distracted by certain pleasantries, obligations, and associations that are not a part of liberation and freedom. These pastimes can help remind us that they happened in the past and can happen to us if we lower our guard. And that's the reason really of so many stories we may read in Srimad Bhagavatam or any of the other ancient scriptures. They're there for a purpose. They're telling the story. But they can help remind us that if they happen in the past and to great sadhus, many, um, um, it can happen to us. So we have to be mindful, alert. And it says here, yeah, we have to not lower our guard. And then what happened? One day the deer wandered off and he became anxious and went looking for the deer. And while thinking of the deer at the time of death, he got the body of a deer in his next life. 
And you know what it tells us in Bhagavad Gita 8, chapter 8. He quotes 8, 6, tells us, Whatever state of being one remembers when he quits his body, O son of Kunti, that state he will attain without fail. So here was Bharat Maharaj, a great king who had renounced an entire kingdom and he became attached to an animal, consequently obtaining that type of body in his next birth. And I'm going to stop there for tonight. Um, any questions? Any comments? Any new people came on? Shruti. Oh, hi Shruti. Welcome. Any comments? Any questions? Any thoughts about your escape? <laughs> Perfect escape. David asks, um, compassion and love can be a distraction. And then Bhuvan Mohan said, when it comes, when it becomes attachment. And then Shruti asked, but if it's devotionally motivated? Devotionally motivated, this is what we just looked at with Bharat Maharaj. He was a sadhu. He was a perfect escape art um, candidate. But that distraction, as long as you're distracted from focusing on the Lord, serving the Lord and whatever is needed for escape, yes, it can be a distraction. And that's what the description here was. He thought about him, he fed him, he, he held him, you know, he kept him close to him. And yet this was one who, that was how he, he, he felt about the Lord. He always thought of him, took care of him, dressed as deity. So yes, that's why we have to be on guard, it says here. Does that help? Is that helpful? Um, she says, I meant, for example, if one is focused in pushing a reluctant, conditioned soul forward in devotional service. But one can't push a conditioned soul into devotion so it has to be on the level of consciousness and we don't know where their consciousness is and we may not be that clear of what level our consciousness is all we can do is offer the philosophy the teaching but without attachment to the results yes I have a question sometimes um, I've read letters to Srila Prabhupada's um, women disciples mm -hmm. who've had children and he'll say that their service to their children is more important than the deity worship and that that should be um, their first priority. So how do you understand, how do you make make that distinction between, you know, their attachment to their children, but maybe they were thinking, you know, I should be doing more temple service and deity worship because that's more important, but then the spiritual master is saying your duty as a wife and mother is more important, and that's your devotional service. Okay, the spiritual master, if he's that close, he understands the consciousness, he understands the heart and the thinking, and if that's his instruction to that particular devotee at that time, that's where they are and that's what they're to do. Because don't forget, again, raising children is not permanent. It's a temporary process it's a temporary thing because they grow 
if we give them all that is needed to give spiritually that will plant <clears throat> the seed of devotion in their consciousness, then as they grow, they can grow and continue in devotional service and have that seed planted and then the mother can go on freely. The thing I have seen and noticed, as the children get older, the parent seems to become more attached rather than detach, as scriptures say, um, of detaching from family, husband, children, and all. But that's, that's my understanding. Yes, he may have said that because they need help at that time. They need that mother at that time. Just as any, even we see in animal life, the cat takes care of her kitten, licking it, cleaning it, feed, making sure it gets up and eat up to a certain time. The lion, the lioness will do the same. So there's a purpose for that parent-child, infant relationship, but it's not permanent. And that we do that piously and we become closer to the Lord. He sees how we're taking care of his part and parcel and we continue in our worship and devotion of, to him. We can move on to the next level and begin planning our escape and we can release our children who we've taken care of um, so nicely because Krishna will take care of them. There's, oh, go ahead. There's comments by um, Edgar um, based on Shruti's question. Edgar says, but if they chant Hare Krishna, the consciousness will be there. Prabhupada attracted many hippies when he came to New York. They were attracted to something new and intriguing, not to Krishna, but with time and chanting, some became first-class devotees. Asked about this, Prabhupada said, so they were convinced to give up intoxication and illicit sex. What is wrong with that? What do the reasons matter if the result is Krishna consciousness? Now, what was Shruti? Asked the question. I thought Carol asked the question. Shruti. That was Shruti. Mm -hmm. About the parent taking no, care. No, I asked oh, you that. asked that. Mm -hmm. What was Shruti? I don't remember a question from Shruti. Um, Shruti's question was um, if it's devotionally motivated, one's compassion and love. Oh, that was Shruti. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Sort of Mm -hmm. And I answered that. Yeah. And then Edgar made the comment just now, what I just read to you. Mm -hmm. And Shruti said, um, His Holiness Bhakti Vasudev Swami Maharaj explained this about the parent and the child relationship. Explained this in saying that the care of the child or home should be in the service of Krishna. If that is the motivation, then it's Krishna conscious service. For example, if the goal is to produce future devotees or preachers, um, yeah, if the goal is to produce future devotees or preachers, that's an important service. And if one brings a child in the world, he or she has brought on him or herself the responsibility of performing it and can't give it up with temple service as the excuse. Very well put, Shruti. Thanks for quoting, sharing Bhaktivasudeva Swami's commentaries with us. Very true. Because I think we had, um, Bhakti Tirtha Swami had mentioned in here how some pious acts, they're not pure. Um, it brings on, what was that? Remember, um, pride? And that in itself is, you know, a, an enemy of the mind. So we have to be very careful and on guard with even our so-called pious. And if it is pure, we just get tested to be sure. That's what Maya's job is. But if we've fixed 
on on the Lord, serving Him, doing everything to please Him, and hearing the spiritual master, then we're well on the way. And when Maya comes with her test, we can move right through it. So it's nine now. Are there any further question comments? I really appreciate you all being there, and I hope you've gotten something from this to increase your spiritual life setting goals for the perfect escape. Um, it's so wonderful to know, at least I feel at this in this lifetime that that escape is possible and the possibility for going back home, back to Godhead, is also possible for us. Or coming back as a helper to help others. But it means focus and, 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 and attention and mindfulness and in excitement and enthusiasm in your spiritual life. Are you feeling that? Are you moving with that? Do you see things moving? Do you feel yourself becoming closer and closer to the Supreme? I pray these things are happening. But do come back and we'll finish, possibly finish this chapter um, next week and see what adventure we go on after that. There's still many chapters in other spiritual warrior books that we haven't touched yet. So thank you for coming. Have a blessed week. And again, I ask if you get anything from a phrase, a word, a phrase, a sentence, a paragraph from Bhakti Tirtha Swami that you're able to imbibe, apply in your life and practice, please let me know and share it with us because as you do that, it's encouraging to others because we it's it's being spiritual is wonderful exciting work full-time work but it's exciting and it can be helpful when we hear how others have taken a, a, a word a phrase a thought a concept and worked with it in their lives and actually experience what they have taken all right or meditated on because as he said if you med meditate on the positive uh, aspect and with excitement, it will manifest in your life. If you're staying on the negative side, that too will manifest. And you can't blame anybody but yourself. So, thank you. Krishna bless you all. Have a blessed week. And thank you again for coming. And I hope to see you next week. Tell a friend. Hare Krishna. Good night.